Good morning, church. How are you today? Maybe some of you are having a good time. Some of you are having a bad time. Some are having a rejoicing moment and some are mourning. God hears you. God hears your heart. God knows your joyful memories, your joyful happenings, and most definitely, your painful scars. Church, as we gather today with your family and with our church family here, let us prepare our hearts as we worship our God in songs and listening to His Word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father God, because change is not the only constant thing in this world. No matter what we are going through, you are our ever-loving Father who will carry us through all these things. You who bless the people from the Bible will also bless us even more. And Lord, as we contemplate on what our what is going to happen in our lives and also what is going to happen in the future, the government, the world. We pray, Father God, that in everything we do, the change that is going to happen in our hearts will be for your glory alone. Father, bless us and be blessed with our lives and with these songs of worship. In Jesus' name we pray.
you are great, Lord. You are working everywhere, Lord. You are omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, God. Your love is greater than what is happening in this world, Lord. And no one can hinder your plans. Lord, we will continue to worship you. We will continue to serve you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Yes, uh, le uh, let's all rise. Uh, as we read the scripture for today, uh, it can be found at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Thanksgiving and prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like working for his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church which his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Let's all be seated. Just as the God of Abraham, the God of David, the God of Moses, the God of Joseph has blessed them with so much, he has and will also bless us. For God loves a cheerful heart, let us give our tithes and offering with the motive of praising God by blessing others and the church He has set to build. The details are in your screen. You can choose which is convenient for you. And may the Lord bless the people who has been called to give their tithes and offering. God, may these tithes and offerings serve its rightful purpose and that is to be used for your glory alone. We have some few announcements. First is the Quapo Scholarship Fund. Quapo, hindi po guapo. It's established to support our own homegrown and soon-to-be ministers and pastors. Kindly indicate in your offering that it is for the Quapo Scholarship Fund, or just Quapo for short. Let us be used by God to share His Word, even in just helping our pastors and our missionaries who are also called for the mission. There's one more thing. Have you already read the news in our page? This pandemic will not stop us from having fun together. It is September and we all know what happens, what exciting happens happening in this September. CCBC Mooncake DG Dice Game. A lot of wonderful prizes are waiting for you. And of course, you don't have to claim it personally. Siyempre, iwas COVID and iwas stress. Every prizes will be e-vouchers. Whether it will be Shopee, Lazada, Facebook, name it. We have it. And since this will be virtual, dice and bowls will be online. You don't have to provide for your family. Because if you will, it will only be for your family. So what are you waiting for? You may register in the link commented below or on our Facebook page. Limited slots only. So 
be sure to properly register. You may also message us if you have properly registered, if you're not sure. Only those who register will be allowed to join. By the way, it is highly encouraged to have one device per one person. So if you're five in the group or five in the family, one per person. The more the merrier, the more chances of winning. But of course, if gusto nyo maging close together, you can also share. Share the one device. Lesser chance of winning, still close kayo. But since we have this kind of DG Dice game, where we are really appreciating if you will show up, show up your screen, so we can see you. We already miss you so much. And to those of you who are asking, sa FAQs, definitely, no registration, no attendance, no prizes. Hindi po tayo ghost. So, make sure you're there. Okay? So, if you have any other questions, you may comment and our customer service representatives will gladly assist you. Let's pray. God, we pray for these events. God, we pray for those pastors who are called to do the mission. We pray, Father God, that you would bless them. They are having a hard time. They're also frontliners, Lord. We pray, Father God, that their hearts will be secured in you no matter how hard it is to reach out to those places who haven't heard your gospel. We also pray, Father God, for this uh, dice game. Lord, we miss each other so much physically. And since this pandemic has stopped us with so many things that we have done before, let this one be a fun game na makalimutan man namin yung stress at problema sa buhay. God, we also pray for our pastor, Pastor Jojo. May you use him to give the spiritual nourishment our spirit needs. May you open the hearts of each one who listens and who needs to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who are you? Who am I? In this vast world filled with expectations of who we should be, who we long to be, who we strive to be, we forget who we really are. Soon, their expectation becomes our composition. Our perception of perfection becomes our motivation. The thoughts of doubt, fear, shame, jealousy, fame, praise, and all other earthly things cloud our minds, cloud our eyes, cloud our perception of who we really are. Be this, be that, they say. But I say, who am I? Who are you? Yes, you. The person who is in front of their screen, the person who is flawed and fills his or her mind with expectations of man. The person who loves but does not feel loved, accepted, chosen, worthless, and just doesn't begin to measure up to the standards of this world. Who am I? It's time that we know, understand, reclaim our identity. I am a child of God. The God who created the world merely with His words. The God who turned water into wine, the Nile to blood, the sun to stop in its tracks. The God who walked in water, made the blind see, the mute speak, the dead rise, the lame walk. The God who died on the cross for my sins. I am a child of God. I am blessed, loved, chosen, holy, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, included, marked. Called. I am a child of God. I have been chosen. I have been claimed by God. And therefore, I will reclaim my identity. Blessed Lord. <laughs> Blessed Lord Sunday, everyone. How are you all doing? Today we continue our series, just like that video that you've seen. Our series is on the book of Ephesians entitled Reclaim. Last Sunday, we reclaimed our blessings in Christ. Today, we will reclaim our hope in Christ. Hope. I mean, that's a big word nowadays, isn't it? I mean, people are looking and longing for hope. 
people are grasping for something that will give them hope. You know, we ask ourselves, is there still hope that we will go back to normal or at least a new normal? Is there hope to an end to this pandemic? Is there hope that even NCR will get out of this community quarantines that constantly changes even in just a span of one day? You know, is there hope for, for healing, for restoration? Is there hope for physical meeting and coming back to worship or coming back to school, going back to school? Today, we reclaim our hope in prayer. Yes, that's right, prayer. You see, this morning, we are going to eavesdrop on a very special prayer by this man, Paul, who wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. You know, this prayer isn't what you normally might expect from Paul, given the situation and the context where, in which he is, was in. Remember, he was writing this from prison. He was imprisoned when he went to uh, Jerusalem and prison in Rome. He was writing basically to Christians who were living in a culture that was antagonistic to Christianity. Christians who were facing persecution. So you would expect Paul to probably pray for protection or deliverance from persecution. There, he was writing to people who may be sick or poor. And so you would expect Paul to write about healing or financial de deliverance. You're, he was writing probably to people who may be wrestling with emotional baggages and hurts and sadness. And so you would expect Paul to pray for peace. But that is not what he was praying for. Kind of like during this pandemic, you might expect a, a message that talks about praying for healing or miracle or an end to this pandemic, right? But this prayer of Paul that we're going to look at and that we read earlier, that our scripture reader read for us earlier, is centered on the blessings of Christ. And let me say this, we can reclaim our hope as we relate as we fully reclaim our blessings in Christ. Let me say that again. We can reclaim our hope as we reclaim our blessings in the Lord. Why don't we just come to the Lord again in a short prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity to worship you this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to my brothers and sisters who are watching this online and worshiping at their homes and even those of us here. Lord, move in, move in our midst, Lord God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of things I'd like to share, uh, three things about this prayer. First, what is the passion or what is the passion behind Paul's prayer? What prompted Paul to pray this prayer that he prayed for? Well, let's look at verse 15. It says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. His, praise, his prayer is prompted by two things. Uh, the context talks about what happened in the previous verses, and he was praying also in light of what he is going to say in the following verses. So both pre- and post-passage are the things we're going to look at. The previous verse, it talks about the blessings that God has given to every believer. So when he says, for this reason, this points us back to the blessings we received in Christ. And I wonder if you still remember last Sunday's message, if you're watching this last Sunday. Remember Karis? Charis is the Greek word for grace. And we use those letters to stand for the five blessings that we have in Christ. And let's, let's just reflect and review that for a while. First, we were chosen by God, adopted into His family, redeemed by the blood of Christ, inheritors of an inheritance that will never fade or perish, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is our, these are our blessings in Christ. But it is one thing to be able to enumerate them, to be able to say them out loud, but it's another thing to embrace them and live them out in your life. And that is why Paul was praying. Paul is praying that they may be able to live out these things in their lives. Now, if you remember, immediately, be, uh, immediately in the first half of, this, of chapter 1, I mentioned that this was just one whole, all these verses 1 to 14 is actually one long sentence. Guess what? Verses 15 to 23, the passage we read earlier, in your English Bibles, you have punctuation marks, you have periods and commas. But when Paul wrote this in the original Greek, it was just one long sentence again. So the whole chapter of Ephesians chapter 1 is basically composed of just two long sentences. It's like when Paul was talking about the blessings that we have in Christ, he can't help himself but, be, but just rejoice in it. He can't he can't help but tell it and express it to others, unmindful of the grammar and everything. The same thing happened here. 
In light of those blessings, as he was talking about praying for them, in light of those, he can't help but just pour out his prayer after prayer after prayer. And so we can see his passion behind this. Now, what drove Paul to pray was not a problem brought about by the Ephesian church. You know, he, he faced some churches which really had problems. Uh, take the church in Corinth, for example. Or even when he wrote to church in Galatia, there were problems that he encountered there. But not for Ephesus, not for the, not for the letter to the Ephesians. Instead, what he saw there, what drove him to prayer, was his vision of the greatness of God, was his vision of what God was doing in their midst. You know, I think this, this movement, this rhythm, is somehow absent or lacking in our, in our Christian life. Because what prompts us usually to pray is when we are, when we're overwhelming need and the overwhelming desire to, for God to fix our problems. Just like yesterday when I saw the news about, you know, 26,000 new cases at being the highest, that prompted me to pray. And so we're prompted to pray because of situations like this. But Paul was not just praying in light of problems. He was praying in light of the praises that he sees in God. He was overwhelmed by the glory of God. Secondly, the second thing is he, was, he prayed for them in light of the report that he received. Look again at that report. He said, uh, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Two things that he heard about them about their faith in the Lord, and about their love for all the saints. By the way, these are two marks of a true believer as well, faith and love. Let me explain that for first. The first mark of genuine salvation is faith in the Lord Jesus. They have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and their faith is genuine. And Paul is saying that, I have heard of your faith. I have heard of how you submitted to the Lordship of Christ, how you've put your trust in the Lord. And I praise the Lord for that. But not only do I marvel at your faith, but I've also heard about your love for all the saints. Now, what is interesting is that for Paul, it's not just faith, but it's faith coupled with love. And that's precisely what we see in the Gospels of Jesus Christ and also in the letters of Paul and many others. Faith is always accompanied by love. Look at what John says in his epistle in 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. And that's precisely what Jesus says in the Gospels. How would the world know that you are my disciples? Not if you could quote verses after verses. Not if you've read Genesis to Revelation a hundred times. But that you love. This is how they would know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. So the true test of our faith, the true expression of our faith is actually love. Paul reiterates that in Galatians 5 verse 6. He says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working itself through love. Faith working through love. You see, faith without love is lifeless. Love without faith is, is permissiveness. But a loveless, a loveless faith is a cause for doubt that that person is truly saved. Faith proves its, its genuineness, its authenticity in love. So upon hearing their faith and love, he did not cease to give thanks for them and prayed for them. Now, there's something I'd like to point out. When we think about praying for someone, we usually think about praying for those who are sick, who are ill, who may be struggling spiritually and all that. Right? Rarely do we think about praying for those who are doing well. You know, when I was starting as a pastor, uh, in my first pastorate, uh, one of the things that I was assigned to do was to uh, write the prayer items that we would distribute to the uh, different prayer cell groups we had at that time. And so I would be the one making, up, making those prayer items. And I would have this habit of praying a special prayer. Praying, I would say, pray for the spiritual growth of brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. And that, you know, stirred quite a controversy because some of the members would ask me, Pastor, why are we praying for brother so-and-so? I mean, has he backslidden? Has he departed from the faith? Has he stopped attending church or a Bible study group? I, didn't, I said, no, 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 no. You see, we don't just pray for people who are doing we, who are probably struggling spiritually or physically, we also ought to pray even for those who are growing, that they will continue to grow, right? Pray for your pastors. Pray for your leaders. Don't assume that, well, anyway, they're already pastors, right? right? They already know what they're doing. All the more that you need to pray for them, pray for protection, pray for covering, pray that they'll continue to grow in their faith, right? So, the, con the question now is, what is the content of his prayer? What, what are the things that Paul prays for? 
Let's look at the prayer of Paul. First and foremost, he prays for insight. I will call it prayer for insight. Verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Now, he says the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, when you look at that, you see a capital S, you might think, okay, this is the Holy Spirit who uh, probably these are gifts of the Spirit. But they're, no, these are not like gifts of the Spirit. This, the word spirit refers more to the disposition. Rather, what he's saying is that it, the Holy Spirit gives us, okay, that wisdom and knowledge that we need in facing life. As John Philip puts it. But however, we, we have to understand that it's the Holy Spirit, that wisdom and revelation could not come apart from the Spirit. So it's a Spirit who gives us wisdom and revelation. But these are not like gifts, spiritual gifts, okay? Or this is not like a spirit of wisdom. But these are dispositions. John Phillips put it, puts it this way. He says, The spirit of wisdom and revelation that gives us knowledge of Him must come from the Holy Spirit. F.F. Bruce says, A spirit of wisdom and revelation can only be imparted through Him who is the personal spirit of wisdom and revelation. So what Paul is praying is that they would have insight and understanding of the knowledge of Christ. That they would have insight into the very blessing that they have in Him. Now, revelation and wisdom. Revelation it's the act of God in which He grants us truth that we would otherwise not know. There are things that God has to reveal to us, things we cannot know for ourselves. And wisdom is being able to apply those truths to our life. And even these must be given to, by God to us. Now, 1 Corinthians, Paul, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 says this, and I like this, said, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has ever conceived what the Lord has prepared for those who love Him. I mean, imagine that. We could not even begin to comprehend. We could not even begin to understand what the Lord has prepared for those who love Him. And he goes on and says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the very depths of God. You know, there are so many things that even the blessings we talked about last time, they're really hard to fully comprehend. Yes, we know them. We understand we're adopted in Christ. We have this inheritance. We're sealed. But what that truly means and the effect it has on us, sometimes it's difficult for us to fully comprehend. Right? We, 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 it parang, you, you'll hear of that term na hindi pa register right? Whatever is happening to me, hindi pa register And that's precisely what is happening. It does it hasn't registered yet because it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to fully comprehend what these things would mean for us. Now, what is the purpose of that wisdom and revelation? It says that you may know God better. I like that term, that you may know God better. In other translations, that leads to the knowledge of Him. But I like how the NIV puts it, that you may know God better. Now, we need the Holy Spirit to reveal more of God and His ways to us if we want to know Him better. Right? The word used, know, the word know here is the Greek word epignosis. This is, scholars say this, this word means intimacy to the utmost. It's like even a sexual intimacy between husband and wife. That, that deep intimacy of knowing Him. It's not just knowing Him in our head, but knowing Him in our lives, experiencing God in the, in the most intimate way. And that is what Paul was praying for, that they would have wisdom and revelation so that they would know Him even more. The prayer for them was to know God better. You know, we should not settle for mediocre Christianity, right? Uh, there are times when we say, well, that's enough, right? Right? You, you read the Bible, that's enough, right? You, you attend service, you watch service online, that's enough. Right? But you don't have to go deep. But that's precisely wrong. We have to go deeper than ever before. We have to challenge yourself to, to level up, right? In your games, when you play games, you want to level up. But why is it that when it comes to the Lord, we don't want to level up in our faith in Him? When you, when you want to grow deep in your love for someone, all the more you want to grow deeper and deeper in love with Him. I kind of like that song that we had in the past. Oh, Lord, I want to know you more. Right? Deep within my soul, I want to know you. To feel your heart and know your mind. Looking in your eyes, tears up within me, Christ that say, I want to know you more. See, the more that you know God, the more that you want to know Him better. 
It's like I have tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord. And, I, and this is something I want to taste and see all the more constantly in my life. Now, why would he pray that believers would have wisdom and revelation knowledge of God? Because ultimately, we can only grow in our walk with God as to how far we know of Him. I mean, our growth in the Lord is dependent upon our knowledge of Him. And there's nothing that, that we could ever boast about except knowing Him. Look at what Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, this is the, what the prophet Jeremiah said, and coming from the Lord. He said in Jeremiah 9, 23, this is what the Lord says, Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts, boast about this, that they have understanding to know me, that I'm the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. If there is one thing that Jeremiah says from the Lord that we ought to be boasting about, it's not about all the things that we have that we post on Facebook. It's that one thing that you know Him, that you really understand who God is in your life. Amen? It's, again, that's not about knowledge, about doctrines and stuff, though those are important. It's about that you know who God is deep down in your life, that you've experienced Him. The second thing that he prays for is he prays for illumination. Okay, let's look at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, there are a couple of interesting terms here, just like, just for, um, you know, that would help us gain understanding of what Paul is exactly driving at here. There are three terms that are interesting in Greek. Uh, in this, uh, I mean, forgive me for going to the Greek, but, you know, there are some things rich that we, you can find when you go back to the original word. For example, the eyes in Greek is the word ophthalmos. Sounds familiar? Ophthalmos, from which we get the word what? Ophthalmology, this, the medicine, uh, uh, branch of medicine that studies the eye, right? Ophthalmology. The word for heart is cardia. Sounds familiar again? Okay. The branch of medicine that studies the heart is cardiology, right? I'm sure some of you constantly go to your cardiologist. And then the word for enlightened is the word photizo. Okay. Think about that, photizo, from which we get words like what? Photos, photographs, right? Pho photograph is an image created by light, and photon is a particle of light. Now, what he's saying here is when he talks about the word for eye, the eye of your heart. See, that is used metaphorically. There, I, our, our hearts do not have eyes, definitely, right? But it simply means that, the, it is, it is that, that our hearts is a, are able to understand and able to gain insight. And the heart is not necessarily the physical heart. In fact, when the Bible it talks about heart, it's the center of one's being. It's both the physical and spiritual being. That which makes you and me us, right? That's our character, it's our intellect, it's our personality. That's the heart. So what he's praying for is that God will open the spiritual eyes of the Christians so that their very beings might be transformed by the insights that they receive from God. It's like your whole being will be enlightened so that your life will be changed and transformed as you know Him better. Now, what are the things that Paul wants them to see with enlightened eyes? First, that they would be able to know the hope of their calling. Right? In verse 18, that you may know the hope to which He has called you. Right? And see, the Greek noun klesis, rather, is the uh, calling. is related to the verb kaleo, which means to call. It is an invitation. So the New Testament uses it to speak of God inviting us to become members of God's family. So what Paul is praying for is that these Ephesian Christians is that they would clearly see and understand fully the hope that is inherent in God's invitation of salvation to them. So the prayer is for us as well that we would fully understand the salvation that we have, the hope that we have in Him as believers, as saints, as Christians. So we need to go merely beyond what, that we are saved to a realization of who we are in Christ, what is our position in Christ, and how we should live in light of that, right? That's why here in the letter to Ephesus in Ephesians, you find this term, as I mentioned last Sunday, in Christ, in Christ, because Paul is striving at one thing. Who are you in Christ? In your union with Christ, what are the benefits that you gain 
And how should you live in light of the blessings that He has given to us? It's the hope of our calling. Secondly, to know the riches of our inheritance. That's the second thing He wants our enlightened eyes to see. Right? The, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people. I mean, right now, we, we only know for, for a fact uh, through the Word of God, what are the rich, what are the inheritance that we receive, right? We can only think about heaven. We know the Lord is preparing a room for us there. We know we're going to spend eternity with God. Now, mind you, does that even stir something within you? Does that even stir hope in you? That's, that, does that even stir excitement in you and I? The fact that one day, when all this is over, or when we're over in this earth, that we will see the Lord one day with our very eyes. That we will see Him face to face. Diba yung term na face to face? Wala tayong fa- there's no face to face transaction. Guess what? When you get to heaven, no mask, no shields. We see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face in all of His glory with even the wounds on His hands and on His feet. And there we would be reminded of what He has paid for, uh, he, he has paid on the cross for you and me. Right? The glorious inheritance of His riches in Christ Jesus. Thirdly, to know the greatness of God's power. And this is where Paul really focuses on here in, the, in our text this morning. The, the greatness of God's power. Verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might? I have a different translation. I don't know if it's there in your PowerPoint, but uh, I posted this as well. It says, what is the exceeding... <coughs> Greatness of His power toward us who believe according to that working of the strength of His might. And I filled that up with some Greek terms. Now, again, for, for purpose. For example, the word immeasurable or exceeding in Greek is hyperbalo. Okay, the hyperbalo is composed of two Greek words. Hyper, meaning over, above, and balo is to throw. This is where we get our word hyperbole. You know that figure of speech, hyperbole? We say that this is an exaggeration for emphasis or effect, right? When we use a hyperbole, we don't necessarily intend anyone to believe us literally, but instead, we're trying to expand their consciousness regarding the subject that we are discussing. When Paul talks about the exceeding greatness, the immeasurable greatness of God's power, he intends for us to imagine power beyond our imagination, right? You can never even begin to comprehend the kind of power that God has. No words could ever describe it. That's why it's immeasurable. It, it, that's why it is exceeding. And then Paul uses four words for power here. He uses dunamis, uh, energeia, kratos, and iskis. He talks about harness power. He talks about significant power. I like the way Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it. He points out that there's a logical flow here. He says, Paul first speaks of energy, a power in action, And then he says that it comes from a force which is irresistible, which in turn comes from the ocean of God's might, the eternity of God's illimitable, he has even a term, illimitable, unlimited power, right? So an energy, a power in action that comes from an irresistible force that comes from the ocean of God's mighty strength. Now, you know why he's driving all this, the point that he's making? John Calvin says this. He says, Paul throws in just about any word that he could describe for God's power toward those who believe because he's, godly people who are engaged in daily struggles with inward corruption realize it requires nothing less than the surpassing greatness of God's power to save us. You know, even as we face this pandemic, we need nothing less than God's surpassing greatness of His power for us to move on, for us to trust, for us to believe that God is in control, for us to, to do still what God has called us to do, despite the frustrations, despite the disappointments, despite the anxieties that people may face. The emphasis here is not just that God has the power. The emphasis is that this power is available for, toward those who what? Who believe, and that's for us. This is available for you and me, right? The, the wonder of what that is. Sit back for a moment, imagine godly power. Not just in cre- the God who created everything. And as He created it, that power is available for you and me. In our small groups right now, which I encourage you to join if you're interested, 
we are going through the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So the small groups now have gone through the first two chapters. And what are the first two chapters of Genesis? Simply God creating, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, in, in our study, we learned that uh, there are about 300 trillion, like 300 trillion uh, stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. That's where we are, right? Milky Way galaxy. And there are about 500 trillion galaxies. And there are tr hundreds of trillions of stars in, hundreds of, in 500 trillions of galaxies. You can even begin to imagine how that is multiplied. Of course, a star is not just a little dot, a bright light that you see in the heavens. That star is far bigger than, even probably bigger than the expanse of sky that you see. And think about 300, tri 300 trillion stars in our galaxy alone. And God created that out of nothing. He merely spoke and it came to pass. Think about the earth, everything He created there. He spoke into being, right? The, the, the animals came from the, from the ground up. Man was formed from the dust and He breathed into us the breath of life. Wow. If you just imagine that same power made available for you and me. And it says, toward those who believe according to the working of His mighty power. When it says according to, I, I mentioned this before, it's not out of His power, it's according to His power. What it simply means is that God exercises the full measure of His might. Whatever power He has available to us, He imparts it to us. He doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to give you 10% of my power or 30% of my power. No, He made available the full power at His disposal. I heard of a story of a of seminary missions class. Herbert Jackson told about how as a new missionary, he was assigned a car that would not start unless, he would push, unless it was pushed. You know, a car that you have to jack up and push, a manual car. So after pondering the problem, he devised a plan. He went to the school near his home, got permission to take some children out of class and had them push his car off, you know, uh, off a hill, right? And as he made these rounds, he would either park on a hill or leave the engine running. So if it was on a hill, inclined, it would be easy for him to go, right? Or if he would keep the engine running, then it would stop. So he kept this out for about two years. But uh, Herbert, ja um, Herbert Jackson finally had to leave, and a new missionary came in. When Jackson proudly began to explain to this new missionary, hey, this is the car that is assigned to you. And uh, this is how you should jack it up, right? This is how you should start this car. And I learned the secret of it. And so this missionary looked at the car, looked under the hood, looked under the car, and said, and looked at, and he turned to the past, the missionary, and said, well, Dr. Ja Jackson, I believe the only trouble is that there's a loose cable. See here? When you jack up this loose cable, connect it, the, star, the car starts running. How foolish that this man, this former missionary, spent two years going through all these motions when in fact the only thing that kept the car from running was a loose cable. You know, you and I are living defeated lives when in fact the only thing that the, the, the power of God is available for us. But we're not maximizing that and using that because we're not connected to Him. That's why the Bible says, abide in me, my words abide in you, Right? If, you, if we abide in the Lord, then we, then we will become fruitful. There's a, that's the consequence of abiding in Him. But we fail to abide. We fail to connect. You know, um, that's why uh, someone says, how tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. And so how can we know God's exceedingly great power? How can we really begin to fathom that? Well, Paul doesn't leave us hanging. He gives us some examples for us. First, he says, we know the greatness of His power in Christ's resurrection from the dead. Earlier, I mentioned about creation. But when Paul wanted to make a display of God's power, he didn't just point to creation. Actually, he pointed to the resurrection. For him, that is the most special um, example of, of God's power, right? Because in, in the resurrection of Christ, let's look at verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? That He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. See, see, Paul is referring to the power of God work through Christ to defeat death. See, resurrection defeats one of the greatest enemies that we have right now. One of the strongest enemies that we have, which is death. 
Remember, we always say there are two things unavoidable in life, taxes and death. You can, some people cheat their way through taxes, but you can never cheat your way through death. I mean, not to belittle what's going on, but you hear of death right and left. I mean, sadly, there's never, I think, a week that I don't see in, on my Facebook a post about someone dying. I mean, you, you find people who suddenly change their profile picture to black or to a candle. Simply pointing out that there's someone in their family who passed away. Left and right, you hear about death and dying. And you know, more than 50% of that are COVID-related. And you look around, you say, all these deaths. Like last year alone, in our family, we, we, uh, we, we, had, we encountered death through COVID and through cancer. Uh, of my father and my sister. And you, we, that was one of the worst years. But even through that, you might think, ah, we're, all, we're always defeated by these big two C's. But I, I, as I pointed out before, there's even a bigger C. Christ Himself. And the fact that Christ has defeated death for us. And that is why we rise together with Him. That we will have resurrection bodies. That we will rise again from death. Christ defeated death on behalf of those who believe in Him. Look at, verse, first, look at how Paul first puts it in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? <sighs> Secondly, we know the greatness of God's power in Christ's exaltation over all other powers. Look at verse 20. That He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. God not only raised Christ from the dead, but He raised Him to an exalted position at God's right hand, a position of authority. And He has authority not just over death, but He has authority over the, over the rulers of this age, over Satan and his minions, over every possible authority and rule that is. You know, so someone puts it this way. You know, Paul piles up words like rule, authority, power, and dominion. And John Calvin says, why all these words? What do they mean? Is this a ranking of the different uh, min minions of Satan? Is this a, a ranking of powers, of earth, uh, spiritual powers? And he says this. Calvin said it was to convey an exalted view of the glory of Christ. As if he had said, there is nothing so elevated or excellent by whatever name it may be named that is not subject to the majesty of Christ. No other name but the name of whom? Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess one day that Jesus is Lord. Amen. You see, we might think, where's Jesus now? Where is the Lord now? I mean, is He defeated? Is He silenced by all this? We may not experience deliverance the way we want to experience here and now on this earth. But God's Word clearly tells us, and I believe it fully, that God has the, had the first say, in the beginning was God, in the beginning, God created. And He would have the last say in the book of Revelations, where even Satan himself will finally be thrown into the very prison that we think he rules. Hell is not a place Satan rules. Hell is Satan's prison forever. And he will be thrown there for the rest of eternity. While you and I who have faith in the Lord, who are redeemed by the blood of Christ, who have this glorious inheritance in the saints, are going to experience God's presence for all eternity. Now who has the last say? Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 15, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying, look at this, every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death itself. Because one day there will be no more dying. One day there will be no more death. No more statistics that you see on screen in your Facebook nagging you constantly of increasing rates. 
None of that anymore. One day, no more death. No more tears. No more mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-G. But only a wonderful morning. Wonderful day with the Lord. Lastly, we know the greatness of His power in Christ's headship over the church. Verse 22, And we put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him, who fills all in all. Note that Paul does not simply say that Christ is the head of the church, but that God gave Him as head over all things to the church. The idea here is that Christ's ruling authority over everything in the universe is God's gift to us. Thus, the church has authority and power to overcome all opposition because her leader and head is Lord of all. That's from Francis Phelps. You know what he's saying? He's saying simply this, that we are part of the church. We talked about the church last time, right? We talked about the church during August in our anniversary month. Guess what? This is a wonderful news, church, brothers and sisters in Christ. Since you are part of the church, you reign and rule with Christ. Everything is put under His feet. And positionally, you and I are in Christ, so everything is put under our feet. Amen? And so that's what we live. We, Christ has authority and power to overcome all opposition. The church has authority to overcome all opposition. And he's, he, he fills all. Tony Merida says this, As Lord over all things, He fills all things, but this filling of the church is different. Only the church is His body and rules it and fills it in a special way. What this means is that we as a church are entirely dependent on Christ. What makes us something significant, indeed glorious, is our relationship to Jesus. He fills the church with His presence. In closing, I'd like to share a story. A story relayed by, by a, a Bible scholar, Bible uh, commentator named Warren Worsby. He says of a late wealthy newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst. He spent a fortune collecting art treasures from around the world. One day, he found probably on the news a, a, a picture of some valuable items that he felt, hey, I must have this item. So he sent his agent abroad to search far and wide for this item, uh, for these treasures. And then after months of searching, the agent reportedly said to him, Mr. Hurst, guess what? We found it. All the while, these treasures are in your warehouse. You know, Hurst has been searching for treasures he already owned. You don't have to search far, brothers and sisters, in Christ. Because these treasures are available for you and me. It is only that we pray. It is my prayer, just like Paul, that our minds and our hearts will be enlightened by the Lord through a wisdom of revelation so that we may know Him better. So that we may know the hope to which He has called us. The richest, glorious inheritance that we have in the future and in the present, the power that is made available through Christ, who is head over all, who fills all, and who's in all and through all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your word. Lord, in the midst of hopelessness, where people all around this world, especially here in our country, we're looking for hope. We're grasping for hope. Just like Abraham, we're hoping beyond hope. But we put our hope in you. And we pray, Lord, give us the insight, the insight to know you better, to know your, your justice, your, your righteousness, to know your love, your grace, your mercy, and your peace. Enlighten our eyes and our, the minds of our, the eyes of our hearts, the my, eyes of our very being, so that we may fully comprehend the hope that we have 
when you called us, when you saved us, with all the blessings that, that was in store, with all the caris that we studied last time. And as we look toward, forward to the future, Lord, we, to, to really embrace and trust and look forward to the glorious inheritance that is ours already in, by faith that, we'll, that we will receive one day. And Lord, in the present, the exceeding, immeasurable power that is made available to those who believe, the same power that at, was at work when God raised Christ from the dead, that same power that is made available according to your strength and according to your might. Lord, fill us. Fill us with more of Christ who fills the church in every way. So whatever we face in this life, in the lives to come, we may do so with hope, with joy, and with your never-ending peace. Now let's all rise for the word of benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you in His care. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you with His grace, with His caris. May the Lord turn His face toward you with approval and grant you hope and peace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen and Amen. end the worship, it is not the end of our worship. As every day should be a worship day. Sunday is not the only worship day. It is our lives that has to be a living testimony. If it is something that we need from God, right now, it is peace. Peace. Because peace brings hope. We should reclaim our lives from God, we should reclaim our hope from Him. As we end this service, I hope that you have been spiritually nourished by the Word of God through our pastor. See you next Sunday.
are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is. stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't feel it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god darkness my god that is who you are 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 you are way maker miracle work promise keeper that in the dark my God, that is who you are. 